Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Lewis and I'm a Senior Director of RISTEC uh, based in the UK. Thank you very much for joining us uh, and welcome to this RISTEC webinar. Uh, the topic today is about carbon capture and storage uh, and in particular how traditional risk management approaches used in the process sectors uh, have been adapted to meet the unique features of CCS. Uh, hopefully we can provide some useful and practical insights for you. Uh, the webinar will take about an hour uh, with around 45 minutes for the presentation and about 50 minutes for Q&A. Uh, a quick spot of housekeeping. Uh, we've muted everybody uh, so the sound won't be distorted by background noise. Uh, so if you'd like to ask some questions, uh, we do encourage questions uh, during the webinar, uh, then please use the Q&A function. Uh, for those of you familiar with Zoom or, or not familiar with Zoom, if you just drag your cursor uh, down your screen, then the then the uh, the bar, the ribbon at the bottom will come up. You'll see the Q and A um, tab there. If you just click on that, type in your, your your question. I'll keep track of the questions, and then we're aiming to cover as many of those as we can in the uh, in, in the time we have available within the hour. Okay, uh, and now I'd like to briefly introduce Ristec to you. Uh, for those of you who who don't know us too well. Um, Okay, so what we do at RISTEC is we help uh, clients to manage health, safety, security, uh, environmental and business risk across a number of sectors where the impact of loss is high. We do that through five uh, sort of different services, uh, consulting, a whole range of specialist risk management services, uh, through online and classroom training and postgraduate education. Uh, we also provide some associates to work at client locations if you have uh, resource or skill shortages. Uh, we also undertake uh, industrial inspections in support of asset integrity management. And we also do some research and development uh, in the field of risk and safety management. I'd now like to introduce our speaker today, uh, Andy Lidstone. Uh, Andy is based in our Warrington office in the UK. He's got over 30 years experience in the field of safety and risk assessment. He's worked across a whole range of um, high hazard uh, sectors, including oil and gas, mining, nuclear and defense, transport, manufacturing and chemical sectors. Uh, but very uh, specifically for today, Andy's also been heavily involved in carbon capture and storage projects, and in particular undertaking both qualitative and quantitative containment risk assessments. Um, his full range of expertise extends across techniques such as bow ties, fault and inventory analysis, failure modes and effects analysis, consequence modeling, has identification and the uh, development and uh, implementation of safety and HSE cases, as well as qualitative and quantitative risk assessment. So Andy's got a huge amount of experience um, and hopefully uh, he'll be able to share that with you today on the specific topic. Okay, so over to you, Andy. Well, thank you very much, Steve. There's nothing like being having a senior director singing your praises to make you slightly nervous about what, how it's going to go for the next uh, hour of this uh, discussion. I've also just spotted that I really need to change my cover photograph as I've got the old Mistech logo rather than the new Mistech logo on my covers. Okay, so as Steve said, what I wanted to, to go through with for you today is to, to give you a, a quick overview of uh, some of the tools and techniques that we've been using, uh, assisting clients with uh, risk management within CCS projects. And you can see some of the example ones that, um, that we've been working on over the past three or four years. Um, it's a very much a, an emerging field. And what we've been trying to do is, we've, well, adapting to challenges um, along with our customers as to working out what would be the uh, the best ways to try and approach various aspects of um, the risks that might exist within a CCS project um, and to make sure that we uh, can assist our clients in making sure that they can make uh, informed decisions as to the risks that might be present and also to, to be able to communicate that to people. Um, very much for today, so I want to draw upon some of these projects um, and to use some anonymous examples from various projects at various times. Um, I'm very much going to concentrate on the, the geological side of things as that is more the, the area where there is 
uh, uh, the the newest areas, uh, if you like, uh, as opposed to the the um, the t capture transportation and the the surface facilities. So within the whole um, CCS area, there there isn't, to my mind, an awful lot different towards how we need to to manage risks in the field of CCS, um, particularly, as I said, the geological side of things, compared to how we would normally uh, approach risk management within um, any other major hazard industry. And so, you know, there are a couple of key concepts within any successful risk management approach that we have to have some form of structure to it and that we have to um, have something that is proportionate to the level of risk and also takes account of the the needs of the uh, the, the stakeholders in there so the, the one of the sort of guiding documents that exists in the field of CCS is ISO 27914, which is looking at um, uh, CCS risk management within CCS projects. And they, uh, you can see the uh, the structure of a risk management approach that uh, is included within there. And you can see that it very much follows exactly the same uh, basic approach that all of us will be familiar with from other uh, standards, such as ISO 31000 for risk management, ISO so 17776, they all contain the, the same uh, basic principles within that. And key parts within this whole uh, uh, structured approach is that we, we need to have something in there that allows us to identify the risks, the scenarios that we might be facing uh, associated with our project, that we can perform a suitable and sufficient level of analysis uh, of those scenarios that allows us to make informed decisions about the evaluation of those. With regards to the uh, the proportionate approach for this, you know, there, there are going to be many drivers uh, for us to be wanting to do uh, risk management within a CCS project. And that there's many things that are going to affect how we can make those decisions. Um, a very commonly used framework um, is one that was produced by the United Kingdom Offshore Operators Association many, many years ago that was trying to answer the question of how do we make risk-related decisions within an, an operating environment. And you can see on the, the right-hand side of the, that diagram, there's a, there's a range of increasing complexity, familiarity of the situation, um, ranging from a type A type decision, which ranges from you know, nothing new and unusual, something that we've had done an awful lot of times before, all the way down to very novel, challenging um, types of approaches. Now, it, to my mind, CCS, we, we have not some knowledge and experience of this. We um, have been some areas where we have been um, re-injecting CO2 uh, back underground for enhanced oil recovery and also for the, the early CO2 storage projects, but it still remains a, a novel um, challenging environment, uh, particularly with regards to communicating to stakeholders, by the regulators and particularly the public at that point. In my mind, I, you know, it's sort of where I've drawn the line is sort of a type B, type C type decision at this point. I realize that, uh, you know, different companies will have different aspects to it, uh, different opinions of that. But the, the key thing within that is that, that, you know, there are going to be a range of decision-making processes that are going to help us make the decision. And risk-based analysis is a, um, a reasonable proportion of that, um, but increasingly, you know, as evidenced by the, the amount of attention at the, the recent COP summit, the, you know, the, the performance and the um, activities of major companies is coming increasingly under concern. And there are going to be some things that, whereas when we're looking at a, a risk, we might regard them as being acceptable, might not necessarily be um, subjectively acceptable to, to other people. And within this area of risk-based analysis, you know, there is also a, if like a, a subset underneath that of, of moving from a qualitative through to a structured, through to a quantitative type of approach. And, uh, and we need to take due um, cognizance of the various at approaches that we have in place to help us answer different types of questions at different uh, levels within this.
uh, within a, a particular project. So what I want to sort of, sorry, I've set the scene, but what I want to sort of approach to you, and this, this is how I've sort of structured this, you know, an, an outline approach towards um, risk management within a CCS project. So we need to know how the, the tools, the scenarios that exist, the, the register, the risk identification leading to the, the specific scenarios appropriate for our project, our location, our um, operating pro profile, and then to have a proportionate approach towards um, identify uh, assessing those risks and so there might be some cases where we would like to do a numerical type of assessment for those uh, which I'll go into and but also a lot of times where we want to go into providing a detailed understanding of the um, the risk controls that exist and I want to introduce the, the concept of bow ties at that point and once we get into the area of assessing and understanding the risks and that allows us to identify what we know what we don't know and also to potentially identify potential further risk reduction measures that can be at a level can be then used to assure ourselves that we have reduced these risks to a level that is as low as reasonably practicable so the areas i want to concentrate on within this webinar is looking at the the risk identification areas and also the the analysis parts of it the the bow ties and the uh, the semi-quantitative type of approaches that we've adopted. I'm not going to sort of sit here and, and claim that these are the only ways that are, the things can be done, but these are tools, techniques that we've been developing uh, with our customers, and so it seems to be working so far. Um, there's always areas where we can improve. Um, I'm very happy to um, have discussions with people as to um, what the limitations are and what things could be done better or co could be done differently because every, every, every project is going to have its own specific requirements at those points. So turning then to the area of risk identification, the first thing is really, you know, if we're going into any form of risk identification is to set the context of the decision. What actually is it that we want to, to, to look at? But there's going to be a range of things. There's going to be things looking at the, the potential that the, um, the CCS project will not fulfill its design objectives. We won't have the capacity to store it. We won't have the infrastructure to be able to transport it to the injection site. Um, we don't have the um, enough spareage to allow us to inject when we need it to or to deal with failures, etc. Um, and also we have to consider that, you know, different phases of the project, there's going to be different amounts of information that's available to us. And therefore that's going to drive different um, levels of risk identification that we're going to be to be looking at. Most of the time, though, we tend to be, um, as I said, I'm, I'm tending to look at um, very much the, the geological storage of, of CO2 in, within this webinar, that we're looking at risk scenarios um, that f to, for us as a company, we want to assess better and also the, the reg regulators will have their inputs into this, that we're looking at primarily things like environmental impacts, potential health, reputational damage as well. So for that, we need to have some form of scenario identification. And so we have a very you know, simple uh, approach towards a, um, a CO2 reservoir. So whether it doesn't matter whether or not really we, we're dealing with um, uh, re-injecting into a depleted reservoir, whether we're storing into an aquifer, um, you know, the same sort of basic ideas approach that we will have CO2 within this. We have a number of potential mechanisms whereby CO2 might be released. There might be um, both vertical or lateral migration via the, the geological structures, either via via the, the cap rocks, the boundary faults that might exist, but also then there may be scenarios associated with the injection wells, any legacy wells that are within the, uh, the reservoir. And, and also that, you know, the, the lateral migration then might also lead to um, exposure of other um, legacy wells at that point. So we need to have some form of structured approach to allow us to identify the scenarios that we're interested in. And we've been 
um, using sort of a, a hazard type checklist approach um, towards going through that to allow for structured brainstorming within the, the project to start looking at uh, potential geological pathways, as you can see up there, but also the potential for man-made leakage pathways, the potential for other scenarios, the, the, the lesser, uh, less likely uh, in some areas scenarios that might exist associated with things like sabotage or uh, activity activities associated with other nearby reservoirs that might exist uh, at that point. And there's a uh, one of the um, guidance documents that exists within the European Union. It's generally referred to as EU Guidance Document 1, and I'll have it up as a, a reference at the end of this. But EU Guidance Document 1 gives a, a range of uh, potential scenarios that you can use as a, a prompt list to, to prompt discussion, brainstorming within that to identify what are the scenarios that, that exist. Once we know the, the scenarios that exist, then it's generally useful to give us some form of level of risk assessment uh, within that so that we can rank those scenarios we've identified in the same way that we would do for you know for most uh, other forms of, um, of, of project. And we've you know we've been trying to sort of we've been using risk assessment matrices for this. Um, which seems to be a, a reasonable compromise between the the complexity of the scenario, the level of information that we've got available to us, and we would approach this to to give us a estimation of the um, the likelihood of a scenario and also the the potential consequences that might occur at that point. And some of the issues that we've sort of come up with this is is you know it's very common within a lot of companies that their risk assessment matrix, that particularly the likelihood scale, will be based around um, historical frequency so you would typically have scenarios that would say you know has has never occurred within the industry uh, has occurred within uh, similar projects has occurred within uh, our company etc and, and so build up in, in increasing levels of likelihood now for such a novel um, technology or uh, application we don't necessarily have the um, the business or the the operating experience to be able to use that and everything sort of tends to get shuffled in, in here towards the, the left-hand side of the risk matrix. So you, we finish up with everything down here. You have to sort of ask yourself, you know, just because it hasn't happened doesn't necessarily mean it can't happen. And we have to present a, a realistic approach towards this. So we've tended to find that, uh, you know, uh, we've had to modify risk assessment matrices to use some form of predictive element within it. So is it credible? Is it practically non-credible? And you know, different different um, companies prefer to use either a possible credible likely type approach or sometimes you know one in a hundred one in a thousand chance that something might occur at that point um, similarly with the consequence side of things you know that it's uh, uh, when we're coming into a structured brainstorming session within a normal um, project we've got a reasonable lot of experience with regards to what the effects of releases of hydrocarbons are going to be we have less so with regards to um, the the effects of co2 that might be released and also how that might well be um, perceived if it were to be released. So it just needs to be some there, a bit of caution with regards to the, the rankings that are given on the consequence side, particularly for environmental and reputational effects to, um, to, to build, build up a realistic picture at that point. Now, there's a requirement or recommendations within the ISO standard and also the guidance document that I was talking earlier to also consider about the levels of uncertainty that exist within our risk assessment processes. And the, 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 the guidance documents talk about uncertainties in the level of risk and um, so that you know we, we may start off with not knowing an awful lot about the risk and as we provide different studies etc then we can shrink and we have a more certain um, certainty with the the likelihood and also the uh, the estimation of the uh, the possible consequences that might exist at that point um, Personally, I'm sort of a bit cautious about this because you know we, we've got a fairly coarse approach towards risk assessment at this point um, in terms of estimations of frequency and consequences. So we've been trying to look at an awful lot of the um, the uncertainty that might exist within the control elements, and I, which I'll come on to in a moment. 
And then once we know the uncertainty within the, the control elements, then we can uh, start asking ourselves, is this an acceptable level of risk? And that our whole idea of acceptability, um, I think, is something that we need to think about an awful lot, particularly in the, given the, the court of public opinion and what people may perceive about the, the levels of risk um, may not necessarily be what we perceive to be the, the level of risk. And we need to be in the position of understanding what people, uh, what the, the, uh, the concerns of the stakeholders are, are going to be at that point. So, we now need to go into what are the controls, what are the um, what types of controls to help us make a decision. The more that we understand about the risk, the more we understand about the controls that are in place to manage different aspects of the risks, the better that we can make our decision. The better we understand, the more informed our decisions are going to be at that point. And we found that the, the concept of a, of a bow tie has been very useful for this, within, both within projects and also within communicating to regulators. It allows us to, to map out a, uh, how hazards can be released uh, and also the controls, the types of controls that exist within this. It's sometimes called as a, I refer to it as a bow tie diagram, sometimes it's sort of um, has been used, referred to as a barrier diagram. And this was used in one of the very early CCS projects, the, the Quest project in, in Canada, uh, and has been adapted from there into um, things like the Golden Eye project, which has gone into then the Northern Lights project, which has gone into the Endurance uh, project within the UK. And you know, a number of those are either operating or have just received authorization to proceed to the next stage. And the basic structure behind the bow tie is that the, the, the hazard in this case will be the, um, the CO2 in the storage. The, the top event would be the point where CO2 has been released from storage, i.e. it's outside of the storage boundaries. Um, where we define the storage boundaries is up to us. On the left hand side, we have the causes, the things that might act to release the CO2. So these might be structural problems. They might be, well, I'll go into some of more of those in more detail. And then the consequences would be the CO2 being released to the atmosphere, CO2 presence within aquifers affecting other users, um, or possibly CO2 being released at a, um, uh, an occupied location, or those might be consequences. And then we have what barriers? Why do we believe that this is a valid approach towards, uh, why, why do we think that this reservoir is, is good, sound, etc., cetera, and uh, that stop this cause from leading to this event? And they might be engineering, operating, main, um, MMV barriers. And then on the mitigation side of things, we also will have the, um, what can we do about it? And uh, what might we be able to do if we were to have this potential scenario? How would we know we have a problem? How could we prevent it? Or could we, if we were to cease injection or to switch to an alternate injection pattern, would that have a, 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 an effect on the, the way that uh, possibly the consequence can develop? So we found that this, and we can also have what's shown on here is degradation factors, things that act to break these barriers, things that act to weaken the, uh, the effectiveness of these barriers. And again, that might be uncertainties in data, it might be uh, other activities, it might be um, areas where um, a structure might be weaker, it might, you know, it might be a localized thinning of a cap rock that might act to weaken the effectiveness of uh, our reliance on the cap rock as a primary barrier to prevent CO2 from migrating from the storage site. And again, we need to have barriers in place to stop those from happening. So this basic approach has been found to be quite useful. and We've adapted it in a number of places. And to give you some sort of indications of what we can have. So this is a cartoon version, if you like, of a vertical flow of CO2 from the storage site. So these might be some of the possible causes that can lead to CO2 leaving the storage site, which could release CO2 at the seabed. So that describes the scenario. And then we can start putting in place the controls. And how do we know, how much do we know about these controls? How much do we need to know? Do we need to study these controls further? Do we need to have more 
more uh, information available to us to be able to convince ourselves and stakeholders that these barriers are going to be effective and will um, remain sound at, at these points. And this is what I was talking about with regards to the, the uncertainty within these controls. You know, the, in the early stages of a, uh, a possible CCS development, we might not necessarily know an awful lot about this. We may have to um, possibly take calls uh, from, um, to, to gauge more information about the, um, the geological processes. We might have to take, conduct further detailed model thing, again, to give us greater certainties about how are we going to set these injection limits, for example. And also on the right-hand side, then there might be um, you know, the overburden, secondary containment, etc., and the possibility of monitoring correction action, which may act to prevent this from happening. So that's a simple representation of, of vertical flow um, from a, a CCS reservoir. We can do similar things with regards to, to lateral flow, and these might be, again, the, the barriers that we are relying on. So we're not, uh, we do not believe that lateral migration will go to the south of this reservoir because we have a bounding fault, and our knowledge of the properties of that boundary fault are such that we believe it will be relative, it will be impermeable to um the the passage of co2 now that degradational factor on that might be that the stress of injection might be causes the bounding fault to become permeable or reactivates it in which case then how are we going to manage that it might be by why the operational controls we put in with regards to the pressure, the temperature of the uh, the CO2, it might be the, uh, the location of the injection wells. All of those might prevent the stresses of injection from making this bounding fault permeable. It comes down to basically, the, you know, the more questions we ask, the more we're going to find out about it. So these are, if you like, these are simplistic versions. We've what we've been doing is, you know, this is a more detailed version that we've been working through. And the bow tie structure allows us to then add additional pieces of information onto it. We can start asking our quells, how effective to this barrier going to be? How uncertain do we have are, are we about that judgment of the the barrier effectiveness? And you know, if there are areas where we are uncertain. Can we do more about it? If there are barriers where the, the barrier is only going to be partially effective, can we improve upon it the same way that we would for any project? But also we can start looking at the, the barrier types that might exist, the barrier criticality, and also the action items. Other um, areas of information I've seen have been recording key responsibilities, which is also a requirement of the ISO standard, and also documentation. I mean, you're never limited as to how much information you can put onto these diagrams. The, the problem generally is going to be that you try to put too much on rather than too little. And so that's an example of the, the detailed structure. And then that allows, I mean, developing the bow tie allows for a lot of communication within a project um, and brings together a, a lot of different specialities um, to achieve a common understanding, allows us to um, assure ourselves and then also to communicate that assurance and as a basis for communicating with stakeholders. So that's the left hand side and you have that similarly on the right hand side at that point you can see there the possible degradation factor might be wells, legacy wells passing through um, other layers and those so those secondary seals at that point um, could be weakened by the effectiveness of a boundary of wells passing through it so we also need to understand the um, the barriers the the controls we have associated with the legacy wells and we, we found that it's been useful actually to, to separate these out to look at both the injection and the legacy wells in there and particularly with regards to the legacy wells to, to sort of modify the um, the approach to to look at the abandonment diagrams when they're available this is some, something that I'm finding is increasingly um, interesting with regards to earnings and as to how many abandonment diagrams may or may not exist. But to look at the abandonment diagrams and to look at potential leak paths that might exist within those, those wells, and then to allow for a discussion as to for each of these leak paths. So you can leak path one up there to look at each of the boundaries that we have within that. Again, to allow for a discussion as to how good do we think that barrier is going to be, how much certainty do we have within it, how how comfortable are we within a project that um, we uh, we have enough barriers in place and that, that this 
this legacy world does not represent an unacceptable risk of leakage to us. Now, this, both of these, this Wells type of approach towards a bow tie um, and also the geological bow ties are primarily are going to be qualitative structured approaches towards risk assessment and risk evaluation. These are the controls we've got in place. This is what we know about it. Do we believe that we have suitable and sufficient barriers in place? We've also found that in some places people, uh, so, um, there have been demands for looking at numerical types of approaches to give us sort of comparative risk values. Um, and a couple of approaches I want to sort of briefly sort of go through with you. Um, we've, we've sort of used a, a simple layers of protection analysis type of approach to, to look at um, numerical estimations of risks associated with um, the releases from geological storage. I would caution very much for all of these numerical ones that the amount of data that is possibly available is, is not great, particularly with regards to um, the likelihood of something and also the potential consequences that might exist. So at best, these are sort of order of magnitude and are very much best used for comparative processes rather than absolute values of um, of, of risk that might occur. So we took a, um, a, a one example, we, we had a number of scenarios that might exist coming out of the bow tie analysis. So that you can see here that the CO2 will be stored in this area. There might be a release path that goes up the injection well. There might be a release path that goes up a boundary fault. It might migrate laterally outside of a license boundary, cross a juxtaposition into a, another area where it might encounter a legacy well, or it might permeate through the secondary cap you know, There are a number of different scenarios that might exist associated with this. So for each of these possible scenarios to estimate a frequency of the release. Now this then is very much an estimation. You know, do we think it's likely, probable, possible, barely credible, almost impossible? You know, is there a one in a thousand, one in ten thousand types of release? And this has to be a you know a discussion amongst uh, experts within the area to come up with our best estimates and you know it is always going to be an order of magnitude. If we can identify the frequency of the release and also to look at possibly the, the consequences, how long would this uh, release occur for credibly before we were able to stop it and what would be the, the severity. And this allows us by combining both the, the severity and the duration allows us to, if you like, come up with a, um, a magnitude of, of release that it might um, uh, occur at that particular point. If we can then combine both of these together, we can start looking at the the um, the scenarios that are of interest, the the likelihood, the the likelihood that this scenario might occur, and also then the 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 controls, the barriers, the things that you know, might be the secondary cap rocks, might be the operating limits, might be the integrity of legacy wells. All of those would have a uh, act as different layers of protection to prevent a scenario from occurring, and that allows us then to come up with you know a simple estimate of the a comparative estimate of the the various scenarios as to what level of risk they. Um, they might pose and you can see here we're talking about in terms of the the percentage of the reservoir that might be released and the the likelihood that that scenario exists very much the you know these are just colors to make it easier to spot it i'm not trying to impose in or imply in any way that these are um, different acceptance criteria associated with these so that, that's sort of adapting a layers of, prote layers of protection type of approach to, to looking at these sort of things. We've also been looking at um, a quantitative, a more quantitative approach, and this has been very much been looking at legacy wells. Um, so you may be, particularly if you're re-injecting back into a depleted reservoir, there may be um, wells that might previously have been abandoned, and we, you know, it may not necessarily be feasible or even practicable to re-enter those wells. So they, you know, if this was abandoned 50 years ago, it may not necessarily be up to 
current standards. So does this represent a, a, um, a release path and how much might we be looking at in that point? And again, this was primarily looking at it from a, a comparative type of approach at this point. So, I mean, obviously you can look at as many wells as you want to. We've, we've tried to screen out wells of concern, if you like, the ones that might see CO2, the ones that won't see CO2, we can stick to one side, possibly just assess those qualitatively. For wells that potentially could see CO2, then again, to look at the, the potential leak paths, the barriers that exist within those leak paths, and to use, as a, again, this sort of bowtie type of approach. In this case, mostly to look at it as a, a means of communicating and, and gathering information from the, the, the specialists in this area. And the, the postulation to, to give us a sort of a, a distribution of uh, possible states at this point was to say that each barrier, the cement plugs, the casing, um, the annular cement, etc., that might exist within a barrier, that they might exist in one of three states. They might be fully intact and performing as well as we expect them. They might be impaired or, you know, they might be failed. We, we set a cement plug on an open hole and it's just disappeared. We, we, we have no means of verifying it without re-entering the well and re-entering the well will just make it worse. So we allow for each of those three states to exist and to, to make, try and make, um, give us a distribution around those things by estimating the, the permeability and probability of failure of each of those the, the barrier in that state so that, you know, if we're looking at a cement plug, we might say, well, we've got 99% co confidence that it's fully intact and our best estimate if it's fully intact is that the permeability of an intact cement plug might be um, 0.1 milliarces, something like that. And if we know that and we know the reservoir pressure beneath the, um, the barrier element, then that allows us using Darcy's law to give us a, an estimation of the, the leakage rate that might exist at that point. We can take that leakage rate and put it into an event tree structure such that we've got each of the, the elements that exist within each of these paths, its status, intact, impaired and failed, the likelihood that it exists and the, the flow rate that might exist at that point. And then that gives us a wide, you know, a distribution of possible end states that might exist. And that allows us to then estimate what the, the potential leakage profile of this well might be at that point. So that we can then plot that out. We can do it simply as a sort of, again, a sort of matrix type of approach. Again, the colors here are just as uh, indicative values. I'm not trying to impress, imply any acceptability in this area. But what we found most useful is to, is to sort of regard this as each, uh, in, each end state on the event tree represents a, a likelihood of occurrence and also a, um, a, free, uh, a mass of CO2 that might be released. And you could sort of think of that for, for those of you that have done QRAs in the offshore industry. The, you know, we, we also, when we're looking at risks to personnel, we have the frequency of an event occurring and the, the numbers of fatalities that might exist at that point. So, and that PLL, the potential loss of life value, is also referred to as an expectation value, the expectation per year that that scenario might exist. So if we were to take the, the likelihood of a particular end state on the event tree, the, the mass of CO2 that that would be um, released, then that gives us an, an expectation value uh, of, um, of CO2. And so we can look at that is a very similar to, for those of you who've come across it in offshore QRAs as a, a, an FN plot. So we have the, the likelihood that this state exists and the mass of CO2 that would be released so that you could sort of draw a line across here. And this is, you know, we're comparing a lot of different wells at this point on this particular plot. So we could draw a line across here and say that the, the one in a thousand case, one in 10,000 case gives us an expected value of X amount of CO2 being released. This can lead then into cost benefit analysis. It can also lead directly into planning for um, well intervention activities. Um, if we are, you know, we are going to plan for um, support companies to come along and if the worst were to happen to do well interventions, and it's going to be useful for them to know what we're, they're getting into at that point. And this, the, the, the other plot in here is, is looking at the, you know, obviously the, um, the, the pressure within the reservoir is going to peak 
during the injection period. And then as soon as we turn off injection, the, the pressure is going to dissipate. And so the amount of CO2 that might be released at that point decreases. So it's a gather, and again, it's another numerical type of approach that um, to give people more information about what can happen to help us make better decisions at that point. So we've got the you know, adapting these risk assessment processes, the, the bow tie type of approach, both for geological and wells um, type of approaches to slightly modifying both of those at that time. We've got this sort of simplified layers of protection analysis and also then these this quantitative wells type of approaches and throughout all of this you know the opportunity exists to then say well okay can we improve upon this can we do anything better is there can we improve uh, can we improve the mmv that we're going to have in place can we improve the the certainty we have around certain areas to assure ourselves that the risks have been reduced to as low as reasonably practicable. Now, um, I mean, I'm very much coming at this from the, the UK perspective. It is a sort of legal obligation here, but it's also a sort of a fairly widely adapted concept in a, a lot of other areas. We always want to seek to improve, and this might be both a qualitative type argument and it might be a numerical type argument. I'm, Personally, I'm sort of a bit more comfortable at the moment with the idea of uh, qualitative type of approaches, because again, I feel that the, the amount of information we have available to us on a numerical basis is, is, is very limited. So that we can go through to look at, particularly coming out of the bow tie analysis, what we know, what we don't know, what we need to, to find out. Um, I'm, for one of the projects I'm, I'm currently working on, we've up to about 150 action items that have come out just from the bow tie analysis of work our way through this to identify areas where we may be in the position of um, improving things. Um, a lot of it is going to come down to MMV. I mean, there isn't much we can do about the geology. We can quite a, a, a get more information. Um, so there is going to always be an alarm decision as to whether or not we drill a um, uh, if, if it's an un unexplored reservoir, do we stick a new well into it? Do we re-enter a, a legacy well? We have to make that decision at some point. Um, but if we have identified potential risk reduction measures, then to evaluate the practicability, what will be the, the level of risk reduction that we would get from doing this? Might be that we would get greater certainty so uh, in our risk risk um, decision, or it might be that we actually can affect the, we can detect something sooner, we can reduce the consequences, and then to start looking at the benefit, the high, medium, low, we can put in values associated with this, and also the sacrifice and the cost associated with this, um, and to make, again, I, know I keep on using this phrase, but more informed decisions. So those are some of the tools that um, we've been using and adapting for geological storage. Uh, briefly, sort of from a non-geological side of things, I mean, there are a lot of the, the tools and techniques we use for offshore, onshore and onshore uh, hydrocarbon industries are easily adaptable at this point um, for both onshore transport pipeline, offshore platforms where we're reusing those for it, to look at it in this point. We've got less to worry about from a um, hydrocarbon, from a, a fire and explosion point of view, um, but we do introduce some new hazards at this point. So you know, CO2 can be a heavy gas, um, so it might lead to suffocation from manned areas, might lead to potential adverse temperature effects, might be corrosive. Um, you know, CO2 plus free water can lead to acidic effects, which might adversely affect other areas of things at that point. Um, and, uh, there are scenarios where cold levees have occurred. I don't I am no way going to profess to be an expert in this area. It's something I'm sort of learning very rapidly about. But, um, you know, these are potential areas of concerns that might exist. And also we have the, you know, a catastrophic failure of a subsea pipeline is going to get um, uh, a potential impact onto um, the buoy local buoyancy around those areas. Um, most of the time, as far as I believe, that existing um, modeling codes will exist for all of these. So we can use um, 
the modeling codes, CFD analysis to predict all of these things. So dispersion models for the vapor phase exist. Um, I understand that there are some areas where there's uh, less validation area, validator validation data available to us with regards to dense phase um, and I have been I've been watching some very interesting uh, discussions about this within some organizations such as Fabic have been talking about this recently. So the tools and techniques are more easily applicable um, for, for that area. It's the, the geological areas is where we've been sort of um, doing things differently I think and trying to. So in summary then um, we need to understand what we're getting into. We, um, we, need, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to adapt um, different tools and techniques. And we, as I said, we've, we've been adapting stuff. Um, we found it reasonably useful. We found it reasonably useful, particularly very much so for communicating within a project, but also for communicating externally with regulatory um, personnel, with regulatory authorities. Um, it's applicable at all stages of the project. The, you know, the early stages, we know very little. We gather more information. We can revisit the bow ties. We can revisit the analysis and gain more certainty. Going back to what I was saying very much earlier about the um, increasing the increasing the certainty, reducing the uncertainty of our decision-making process. Quantitative approaches can be used. As I said, I have um, they need to be used with caution and to reflect the amount of information that we actually have available to us at those times. So they're very much to me um, indicative comparative values rather than absolutes. I mentioned a couple of these earlier. So you've got the, the ISO standard up there, and I did mention this guidance document one. Um, and there's a couple of other uh, things up there. Um, one of the tech projects we've been involved with within ASRIS Tech um, was a EU funded project called Detect, uh, which was looking at um, bow tie analysis and also the flow of CO2 through fractures and faults within CO2 storage reservoirs. It was done with uh, Heriot Watt University, Arkham University and Shell. And a lot of stuff came out of that, including uh, some template bow ties uh, and some also some more um, uh, information about possible approaches towards risk management within bow ties. And we, all of that, because it was EU funded, is publicly available. Um, we're very happy to, to share that with you. I've gone over by about two, two or three minutes, so um, I thank you all very much for your attention. I hope that some of the things I've said have been um, interesting or thought-provoking, um, and I'll pass it back over to, to Steve. Excellent. Thanks very much, um, Andy. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got a, just under 15 minutes uh, for any questions uh, that you have, so please... Uh, there's, there's no open questions at the moment, so please, if you've got some questions, just type them into that Q&A function. Um, but just whilst we're waiting for, for some of the questions to come in, I'll, I'll just kick things off. Um, yeah, Andy, so, so, I mean, bow ties are usually developed in a workshop environment involving a number of specialist uh, sort of disciplines. Um, what types of specialists, you know, should, would be represented in a core team that's looking at a CCS project like this? That's the I guess the, my first part of my question. And the second part is, um, have you got any tips on how you'd run those workshops effectively, perhaps in terms of the number of participants and I, I, pre-work you might do beforehand? Or, or... I, I have I have acquired, and the, the reason I'm laughing, I have acquired so many grey hairs with this. Um, typically, you know, if we were looking at hydrocarbons um, aspects, you, you sort of, um, you, you ask for sort of six to eight people um, with people, or plant operators and mechanics and electricians and um, the piping engineers and things like that. What I've very much learned over the past um, two years has been that uh, within the, the geological aspects, 
everybody wants to be involved and it's been not uncommon to have bow tie workshops involving 20 or 30 people um, from a very wide range of, of specialities so i just used to think i in my simplistic approach i just used to think geologists now i'm learning very rapidly that there are geochemists geophysicists geomechanics reservoir engineers cementing engineers etc etc um it makes it a fair bit harder for the facilitator who's chairing the bow tie sessions. Um, but I think that it is very well, very useful to have quite a wide selection of people present purely from a communication point of view and to making sure that everybody is singing from the same song sheet and has got a, say, a common understanding of uh, the risks that might involve the, the pathways that might exist um, for CO2 to come out of a particular reservoir, particularly when you're talking about the interaction between ge geological release mechanisms and legacy wells. Um, you know, the, the geologists might be concerned about something like here and the, the well engineers might not necessarily be concerned that this this legacy well is off plot so they were not necessarily considering that it was something they had to worry about i would very much say that the the key message for all of this is that the preparation side of the sus has to to come up with some structure uh, a, a template skeleton type of a bow tie to say, you know, this is the, the mechanisms. There's lots of different ways to draw up a bow tie representing geological release mechanisms. And I've used different different approaches within different projects. So it's critical to have something that you can um, explain to people and to show that this is the logic of the, the flow. This, this is how CO2 could be released. These are the barriers we have in place at this point, because you really can't just go into something like this with a blank piece of paper um, and inspect to, um, to wing it in that one, that point. Okay, thank you. Um, still no, no, no mm. questions come in. So I'm just gonna, I, I find this fascinating. So I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions myself. Uh, of course, if anybody's got a question, please, please type it in. Um, yeah, I think it was slide 19. You, sh you showed a little table that had some uh, sort of illustrative risk reduction measures, presumably yes. dropped out of one of the projects you've been involved in. But, you know, more generally, are, are there any fairly sort of common practical risk reduction measures uh, that you've seen drop out of the range of from the range of projects um, you've been involved in are there any sort of common themes I, that, that, yeah. that, that come out of this um in the early stages of the project the, the common theme is more about getting additional data uh getting better understanding can we do more modeling for uh, certain for certain aspects um going back and saying um, there's been a number of cases where people have gone back and they, you know reinterpreting um, samples, um, getting calls back, etc., at various times to to look at stuff. As the the the, the understanding develops, um, then the the focus tends to be very much more towards the um, measurement monitoring and, and verification side of things and to now that we have a better understanding of where the potential releases might occur um how how likely it is that um, these releases might have occur then what tools and techniques couch can and should we start employing at various times um are we going to put in permanent landers um on the seabed around legacy wells or do we believe that the the level of risk benefit from having a permanent lander is um so it, it, do we believe that the, the the likelihood of a release from this well is, is, so, is so low that the risk reduction of having a permanent lander would be even lower so therefore it's not worth doing are we going to shoot um, seismic before we go in are we going to shoot it every five years and are we going to shoot it at closure or are we just going to do it at the beginning and the end um, again you know the, these are case specific decisions at that point um, so a lot of the, decision making um a lot of discussion goes into as to what as the the practicability of various uh, mmv technologies and that also may take account of what's actually been developed what's been proven um and you know there are going to be some technologies that might be out there but are they actually going to be available and field proven by the time that we want to use them 
Um, and then the other place, I think, has also been looking at the uh, design of injection wells. Um, what are we going to put in there? Um, and the, the completions um, in there at that point. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank, uh, that, that's, that's really useful. And, and, and I think you partly sort of touched on my next question, really, which was, I mean, a major thing that you've highlighted during the presentation, Andy, was the uncertainty, particularly in likelihood of releases uh, and the effectiveness of barriers. And certainly compared to, you know, traditional risk assessments you do for a hydrocarbon or chemical process plant. Um, I mean, do you see this uncertainty being reduced over time within the industry? And, and so if so, how, you know, is it going to be shared? Will there be more data sets? I mean, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of work that's being done with regards to, uh, there's a lot of research being work that's being done. I, I know that there's a, a project ongoing at the moment that's looking at the uh, the long term stability of um, CO2. I'm um, oh, sorry, the long term st stability of cement exposed to, to CO2, and looking at particularly with regards to the integrity of um, of legacy wells and the abandonment plants within them. There will only be more data that is collected as uh, the technology develops. I mean, there have been problems with a number of CCS projects already with regards to um, unexpected mechanisms that have, have occurred. Um, so I think that, yes, industry will, um, will get more information as uh, more projects get completed. Um, but it's also, we did an exercise with one of the projects recently. Um, we'd been working with them from the, the early concept phase where the bow ties actually was instrumental in saying one particular target reservoir was no, was no longer practicable because we could not um, it was not worth proceeding with because we could not um, guarantee the integrity of the storage site. Um, we worked from the, the earliest concept all the way up to detailed design. Um, and we did an exercise with them where we looked at the, the bow ties from early design through to the midway point through to the final design as to the, the certainty that was available to them. And you could see that the um, in terms of red, yellow, and green, there have been a definite shift from the reds and the yellows towards the green side of things um, as more information had become available to the project. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, okay, so this, if there's no other questions coming mm -hmm. in, uh, then I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll wrap up now. Um, but if, if after we finish, if anybody uh, doesn't have any questions that uh, spring to mind, um, or, in fact, if you'd like any further information uh, about what Andy's talked about today, uh, then please just sort of simply contact us. You can just use the general uh, inquiries email address that's just shown on the screen there or get in, get in contact directly with Della Mullen, who you would have received the original invite uh, to this webinar from. Um, you can also go to our website, uh, risktech.tuv.com and literally on every page there's a form you can fill in and get in contact with us um, okay so thanks again uh, Andy oh, um, and thank, you, thank you and thank you everyone uh, for your attention today uh, really grateful for you taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen in um, okay so please stay safe and stay secure enjoy the rest of your day goodbye bye